Earlier this week, Tanya and I got up at 4 a.m. and at 5.30 headed out on the road to Nashville, Tennessee. We were making great time until we encountered an extremely valuable nail that one of our tires encountered. And happened to be, by the providence of God, the very next exit we pulled over and there was a tire repair service place. And Tanya and I tease when such things happen. We say, we wonder if those are the folks that are scattering the nails out on the road just before you get to their location. It cost us not a lot of money, but a delay of 30 or 45 minutes before we could get on the road again. Sometimes little things are worth much more than we estimate. On the way back home to Keller, we met a very valuable rock. Thanks to a generous truck up ahead. And you'll see if you look at our windshield today, the chip that's there as we began calling and finding out what that rock was worth and what it would cost either to repair or replace the windshield. Not only that, if you look at the windshield, you'll also see countless bugs across the glass that made the ultimate sacrifice. And that was the place where they gave their very lives. In fact, every day we set a value, don't we? A price, an importance, a level of significance to people and things and time and money and work and ourselves and to God. Every day we appraise God. And we determine again to love Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength that those around us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We've come to this point in the week that changed the world. If you're visiting with us, we'll be talking about the events leading up to and following Jesus' death, where there's the appraisal. And you heard, as Derek read a moment ago, the chief priest and the authorities saying, we have to find some way to arrest him, get him out of the way, removing him. He's causing us nothing but trouble. And then you have this woman, John identifies in chapter 12 as Mary, and she has this alabaster vial, this extremely expensive perfume, and she wants to break the neck of that jar and pour it all out only one time for one person and one episode, and that's Jesus. And he said to the disciples, he's done this, she's done this for my burial. And this report about her will be told everywhere the gospel goes, and here we are talking about it today. At the same time, you have Judas Iscariot, what can I get for him? Ah, 30 pieces of silver. And so he works out a deal with those that are determined to take Jesus' life. And through it all, you have God the Father who has promised long ago he would send a Savior. In Isaiah 53, by his stripes would be healed all our iniquities, all our wrongs, the, the chastisement that would make us whole would be placed upon him. All we like sheep have gone astray. And so God would value Jesus as the one, the only one. As Keith read with the Lord's Supper in John 10, the only shepherd that could lay down his life voluntarily to save us from the wolf that would attack us. So as you come to this part of God's Word, you note also, if you ask, what was Jesus doing when he's not in the public eye? Luke tells us by inspiration that he would teach in the temple early in the week, but at night he would go out and lodge on the Mount of Olives. And of course, that's where he's going to be on the night of his arrest. Early in the morning, the people would come, and once again, this mounting popularity, but also resistance and pressure and hostility from those that were disturbed by Jesus' teaching, by his character, by his boldness, and by his courage. And everything we've seen is leading up to what is going to happen to him. And he never hesitates to say what has to be said, to do what must be done, to face this growing opposition. And he will not back down. And so every person then, and every person has to decide today, what do we do with Jesus? What's he worth? What's the value? And Jamie led us in that song, worthy of praise is Christ our Redeemer. Worthy of glory and wisdom and honor and power. A few moments we'll come to Revelation 5 and we'll see that's the song in heaven. Here's the lion. Here's the lamb slain. And so we ascribe to him everything we are. All that we have 
every opportunity, every day, every aspect of our lives. So let's think, first of all, about these leaders. We read in Mark 14 that Jesus is one that they believe they have to eliminate, to eradicate, extinguish. Can't do it during the feast. Passover's coming, and that's going to be part of it too because in God's timing, Jesus will die during that occasion when the lambs were offered up to him. Here would be his perfect lamb for us. I'd like you to turn with me to John chapter 11 because here you can see the kind of issues that the Sanhedrin, the Jewish court members, were wrestling with. In chapter 11 and verse 47, after Lazarus has been brought back to life, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and they were saying, what are we doing? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. Can't let that happen. The Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. In other words, the emperor is going to hear of this upheaval, this excitement. And some of the public crowd is calling Jesus their king. And this is going to be perceived as a threat and a danger. And so they're going to send armies and soldiers from the capital to attack us. And we'll lose what we have, what we've been building for. This all because of this one man. Notice the appraisal. Caiaphas, high priest that year, says, you know nothing at all. It is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. In other words, if we kill Jesus, the Romans won't come and kill us. He can substitute. He can take the place to where we then tell the powers that be, yes, he was a radical, he was a rival, he was dangerous, and we got rid of him. And then Rome will be happy with us, and we can keep our stuff, we can keep our comfortable way of life. Notice what John says, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, Caiaphas prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. John could see a prophecy here. Jesus in place of the nation. The Savior instead of sinners. The righteous, innocent, spotless one. And because he would die, we don't have to. Because he would be rejected and disgraced, betrayed, arrested, nailed to a cross. Think of what he's doing so that the nation, and we would say the world, wouldn't have to go through that. We could actually trace back all the way through the Gospels. We could see in John 2 when Jesus talked about the temple, destroy the temple and in three days I'll rebuild it, how upset they were about that. We can see Jesus in the synagogues casting out the demons and healing the man with the shriveled hand and on the Sabbath in John 5 causing the invalid at the pool of Bethesda to rise and walk and carry his mat. We could go back to the day of acclaim when Jesus was recognized by the crowd and the leaders were threatened. Or the day of authority when he cast out the money changers and overthrew their tables from the temple. Or that day of argument that we've been discussing for quite a while now in this series. And how he would tell a parable about the landowner and the tenants. And the tenants were these keepers of the land. The Jewish authorities had failed. Two sons. One did the father's will. The other didn't. They were the son that didn't. And you could go through, basically encounter him. Back in John 7, they sent officers to arrest him at the Feast of Tabernacles. When those men came back empty-handed, those in charge said, why didn't you bring him in? And they answered, John 7, 46, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. So they've tried time after time after time. Now they say, don't do it in the daylight. People will see it. And the burden will be back on us and we'll take the blame. Let's set up something sneaky, something secret, something behind the scenes because he is our pressing problem and we have to stop him. Mary, 
this flask of ointment, apparently imported, that which might have been worth 300 denarii or day's wages. That is, it would take almost a year. Any of you think perfume's expensive? Go back to the first century. It had to be brought from far away. And the flask was made out of alabaster so that it could only be opened one time. And once you broke it, it was it. You didn't get two shots. And I love the fact that Scripture says the whole house was filled with the perfume. If you will take your alabaster flask and pour it out on Jesus, everyone you touch will be able to smell the aroma. Paul wrote the Corinthians. He said, we're the aroma of Christ for life and for death. For those that are following Christ, we carry this fragrance and it means they're going to live. And for those that perish, it's a reminder that without Christ, they have no life to look forward to in eternity. I mentioned this Mary because she's the sister of Martha and Lazarus. Her value statement regarding Jesus certainly reflects the miracle regarding her brother who had been in the tomb four days. Remove the stone, the Savior said, and they hesitated because of the odor. Did not tell you if you believe you'll see the glory of God. And they rolled the stone away, which he did not do for them. That was their part. And the dead man came forth, still bound in his burial clothes. How could you see that and not give him your ointment, your treasure, your stuff? Whatever you've accumulated or saved up for or bought, why wouldn't you go through your whole house and say, what do I have? What's the most significant thing in my life that would make the biggest statement, like the song says, take my life and let me be. Take my silver and my gold. Let me be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my mouth. Take my heart. Take my mind. That's the spirit of Mary. Now, if you were to turn to Luke 10, starting at verse 38, there you would find the same woman and her sister Martha. Martha, to her credit, invites the Lord to come to their home. She's got everything set up. But she's so perturbed, she's so cumbered about with getting everything just right. We know how that is. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Martha complains, oh, Lord, don't you care? She's not helping me. I have all the chores to do. And Jesus said, Mary's chosen the better part. Got to clean the house. You could do that earlier. You could do that later. Here he's going to say, you need to help the poor. They're always with you. But there was only one setting in which Mary could do this with what she had for Jesus. And he interpreted that. She's done this for my burial. This is like the anointing of the body whose life has been taken. And so here, Mary. You know, so many things in our lives come about as statements from our actions. What did Mary say? Do we have a lot recorded of her words other than in John 11 when she and Martha were both upset that Jesus hadn't come earlier? If you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Mary's message is, in the sense, a silent one. And so it is with you and me. We need to talk about Jesus. We emphasize that so frequently. But what we do with our hands and with our feet and with our things and with our time sets of value, appraises Jesus, and indicates, in fact, this is what he is worth. There's a fictional story told about a wealthy multimillionaire that died, and his items were being auctioned off. And people bid high and tried to outdo each other to get the things that were considered valuable. At one point, the auctioneer brought up a picture of, it was a portrait of the man's son. Plain old frame, plain old picture. Nobody was concerned about the man's son. They wanted what the man had left behind. And so almost no one bid on the 
portrait. And it went on and on and on. And finally, one person, okay, I'll give you a very small amount. And when they took the picture, the auctioneer answered, the auction is over. What? All these valuables sitting back here? That's what we wanted. The auctioneer said there was a document on the back of the portrait of the sun that said whoever gets the sun gets it all. That's the message of the New Testament. Starting in September, we're going to be in the books of Philippians and Colossians. And the theme of Colossians will be Jesus Christ is fully God. Colossians 2, 9. The fullness of deity dwells in him. And the next verse, you are full. You are complete in him. Don't let someone tell you that you have the son, but that's not enough. You're missing something. There's something else out there. Whoever gets the son gets it all. Judas. If you read the parallel account, John 12, you'll note that the Gospels don't always record events in exactly the same order. The Holy Spirit, by inspiration, directed Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John to write what they did in the way that they did, sometimes arranging by topic rather than in a chronological sequence. I've mentioned to you before that we're talking about these days, acclaim, authority, argument, appraisal, but we could also look at these as themes rather than calendar hours. But at any rate, John chapter 12, when Judah speaks up about the poor, if you look there, and he's identified, he's singled out as the, this could have been sold, and all the money given to the poor. Is Judah thinking about the poor? Who's on his mind? Poor Judas, right? Because he keeps the money bag, John says, and he would take what was given, what was donated to support the ministry of Jesus. You can read in Luke 8, 1 to 3, that there were various people, including some significant women, that donated to Jesus' ministry out of their own private means. Do you ever wonder how he had what he needed. We know he had no place to lay his head, no permanent home, but his sustenance, his daily provision came from these women. Luke 8, 1 to 3. Only Luke records that. But that money would go into a bag. And Judas, you talk about a fraud and a fake. How did he fool everybody? So he's the treasurer. Can you believe that? The Bible says that Jesus knew from the beginning who would betray him. And at the Last Supper, when he dipped the bread and he said, the one to whom I give this bread, the one who takes this bread is the one. Even then, when Judas took the bread and Jesus said, what you do, do quickly, Judas left. And John says it was night. It was night in several ways. The others around the table assumed, since Jesus dismissed Judas Iscariot, that Judas was going to buy something for the feast the Passover, or was going to get something for the poor. Judas is a wake-up call to me and to you, I'm sure, that a person outwardly could be with Jesus over and over and over again and not be treated with any suspicion, but instead entrusted and included, even in a special way. And yet John says in chapter 12, he was a thief. And he went to the chief priest and he basically said, what will you pay me? What will you give me if I hand him over to you? And then he will arrange that that Mount of Olives, that Gethsemane area we mentioned a few moments ago where Jesus will go at night. Judas said, I know the place. I know where and when and how you can take it. The Bible warns the second letter of Peter of those that would use religion for their personal enrichment and enhancement and the increase in their bank account. It's been a danger all through history for one who wears the name of Christ to seek what the King James Bible calls filthy lucre 
that which might come to one's own financial advantage. At the cross, open please 1 Peter chapter 1. Jesus really was appraised by everyone on the scene. We could take this theme and say, Pilate appraised him. He's innocent. What evil has he done? Let me wash my hands, but on the other hand, I'm going to get in trouble unless I do what they're pressuring me to do. The crowd, give us Barabbas. They set a price on Jesus' head. Herod Antipas, who examined Jesus and then sent him back. The Sanhedrin, the Jewish court that we noted, putting him through these mock trials in the middle of the night. The soldiers appraised Jesus. But through it all and above it all, the marvel of God's grace, the wonder of his love, his power, and his providence. He is working through every individual, every decision, every person in the auction house Everyone that say, this is what I think we ought to do with Jesus. And from heaven, God has designated before the foundation of the world. He is the precious, most valuable, inestimable lamb, spotless and without blemish. 1 Peter chapter 1, 17 tells us that we are to conduct ourselves in fear before our holy God. And the reason given is in verse 18, because you know that you were not redeemed with perishable things. It wasn't silver. It's, that's not worth all that much. It's not gold. It's not worth a great deal relative to what you needed to buy you out of bondage, out of your slavery, out of your lostness, out of your darkness, out of your eventual destruction. You needed more than that. You needed the precious blood of a lamb. I frequently see commercials telling me to buy gold. Do you see those? Silver. Silver's going to go up 300% the next six months. And I think, then why do you want to sell it to me? And the world is telling you, buy this, invest in this, get this. This is what makes life work. Gold, silver, stuff, fun, entertainment, whatever it may be. You were redeemed, not with those less valuable things, verse 19, but with precious blood. The lamb unblemished and spotless, that is of Christ. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he's appeared in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Redeemed, purchased, liberated, separated from that old master that tore you down and oppressed you and afflicted you, from whom you couldn't seem to break free no matter what you tried to do. And it wasn't money. It wasn't stuff. It wasn't what's in the bank or what's in the barn or what's in your pocket. It was a lamb. And he had no blemish. Perfect. Sinless. Spotless. And that's how the Father appraised him. Now look at chapter 2 in 1 Peter. And notice how you and I also appraise him as precious. Chapter 2, speaking of Jesus in verse 6, as the precious cornerstone rejected by the builders, that is those of his time. Why? Because they undervalued Jesus. Why did they send him to the cross? Because the estimate they had of what he was worth, their appraisal was so opposite to God's. But look at verse 6. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. He who believes in him will not be disappointed. 
This precious value then is for you who believe. John 1, 29. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, what did he say? What did he call him? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Passover. The animal slaughtered. The blood placed on the doorpost. And that night, the firstborn protected and spared because the blood of the Lamb covered them. John saw Jesus made that connection in 1 Corinthians that should be 1 Corinthians 5, 7 and 8 1 Corinthians Christ our Passover has been sacrificed but finally as you and I see the lion and the lamb as we imagine how heaven appraised him to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And as we, through the ears and eyes of John, see that heavenly multitude ascribing to Jesus Christ and to the Father on the throne every possible attribute of holiness and glory and majesty that could ever be noted then we realize we're here today. And what we say and what we do, how we act in our relationships, the influence we have over the lost, the way we treat our family and our loved ones, the way we regard money and work, all of that is our way every day, consciously or not, of appraising Jesus and setting a price on him. I'll post this on the Serving and Sharing blog. I won't read them all. To the baker, Jesus is the living bread. To the banker, he's the hidden treasure. To the builder, the sure foundation. To the carpenter, he's the door. To the doctor, he's the great physician. To the educator, he's the great teacher. To the geologist, Jesus is the rock of ages. To the horticulturalist, he's the true vine. To the jeweler, he's the pearl of great price. What will you do with Jesus? What is he worth to your soul and your life and your priorities and your directions and your decisions and your words? Each Lord's Day, we offer an invitation and we sing a song. And today it's a decision that you might make. I've been setting such and such price on Jesus compared to other things I've been bidding on. I think I've been bidding too high on those and not enough have I placed on him. One author wrote about having a dream in which he went into a store and all the expensive items were marked super cheap and all the little things were way overpriced. And in the dream, and then when he awoke, he asked himself, who switched the price tags? Who decided that that was worth all this and that what truly mattered was worth so little? You might make that decision about Jesus today to turn from sin, to confess his name, and to be immersed into his death and then raised with him after burial in water to begin a new life. We're going to sing a song and encourage you. Let's stand and sing.